On behalf of Lady Study Group Kolkata, I welcome you all to our event with esteemed speaker, Professor Gagandeep Kang, topmost virologist in interaction with Dr. Indranin Mulli, oncologist at Tata Medical Center. The topic of discussion is lessons from a virus. I invite Dr. Gagandeep Kang onto the screen, please. Welcome to Lady Study Group Kolkata, and thank you for giving your time. Thank I you very much for have, having me here. I invite our moderator, Dr. Indranil Molde. Thank you, Indranil, for joining us. I request Dr. Molde, Indranil Molde, to introduce our esteemed speaker and carry forward the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, indeed a privilege to be in this meeting uh, with both you and, and uh, Professor Kang. Uh, who is Professor Gagandeep Kang? Uh, she is uh, you know, a leading microbiologist and expert in infections, and she's also an expert on vaccines. She's a professor in the Department of Gastrointestinal Sciences at Christian Medical College, Bellore, where she leads the Wellcome Trust Research Laboratory. She also you know, took a few years off from Bellore to set up the Translational Health Sciences and Technology Institute in Faridabad a few years back. You know, her special interest is in infections in children, specifically childhood gut infections. And it is here that she's extensively studied uh, a virus known as the rotavirus, which is the commonest cause of childhood diarrhea, and in fact has developed an indigenous vaccine here in India for the people who need it the most. As a leading international expert on vaccines, she has served as an advisor to several agencies, including the World Health Organization, the Wellcome Trust in the UK, several other international bodies. In 2016, she won the Infosys Award for Life Sciences, I believe the first physician scientist to get that award. And in 2019, she earned the rare distinction of being the first Indian woman to be elected fellow of the Royal Society, a society that started in the 1660s and includes in its roles people like Isaac Newton. So it's an absolute privilege to have Professor Gagandeep Kang, uh, truly one of the pioneering scientists in India at the moment. Welcome, Dr. Kam. Thank you for the very generous introduction, Indranil. So what we're going to do over the next hour or so is uh, I'm going to you know, take you through a journey of what I uh, you think we should know about you and your work and your you know, expertise on COVID-19. Uh, and then at the end of about 45 minutes, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Rupali Basu take questions from the audience, and uh, that will go on for about 15 minutes. So to get started and to know a little bit more about you, you know, as doctors or even from the public eye, we, we see doctors as surgeons, as physicians. What, what is it that took you to microbiology, the study of infections? Well, in the 1920s, there was a book written called Microbe Hunters, and it told many stories about the pioneers in microbiology, how they identified pathogens, were able to make the association of pathogens with disease. What a game changer that was in the history of medicine, and how the relationship between a pattern of clinical finding and laboratory investigation can give you answers that you couldn't find in any other way. That got me really interested in microbiology. 
And then it just seemed to make sense. There is a logic to infectious diseases. There is a logic to pathology that allows for investigation, understanding, and discovery. So it just seemed the most fascinating field to me. So when I had the opportunity, I decided to take it. That, that's, that's fantastic. I, I think that in the pandemic, we, we have come to realize the importance of branches like microbiology, like epidemiology, you know, branches that were, uh, you know, not right in front of the public eye till a few years you know, back. So I think that it, medicine as a whole is such a, such a diverse, you know, you know, subject that's with so many avenues in which you can go into. And carrying on from that, I mean, what is it? I mean, you, you, I believe you went to the United States for, for training and it is there that you got interested in, in rotavirus infection. How, how did uh, this become a major focus of your research? Well, it wasn't like I wasn't working on rotaviruses. I was working on bacteria, viruses, and parasites that caused enteric infections uh, in children. And we did outbreaks of in, you know, gut infections all over the place in southern Tamil Nadu. So we had a very active microbiology program. But to give up all of the diversity of all the bugs in your gut and to focus on viruses was led, uh, really came from the fact that bacteria are very complicated. A bacterium is capable of living by itself. A bacterium has a thousand genes which can make many, many different kinds of proteins that influence its ability to replicate, to be able to survive, to be able to infect, to cause disease, a number of different things. And I spent about six or seven years studying bacteria and then they just seemed so complicated. I got to the point where I thought I could work a lifetime on one bacterium and I'll have two or three insights. So let me look at something simpler. And the simpler was viruses because viruses have a very restricted number of genes. Therefore, they can make a very restricted number of proteins. And uh, quite frankly, in my field, which was diarrheal diseases, there was one virus that stood out as a cause of disease above everything else, above all the bacteria, all the parasites. You could take everything, put it together, and it would not cause as much disease as rotavirus. So since it had only 11 genes and made only 12 proteins and was an important public health problem, particularly in India where people didn't even recognize that viruses were causing the bulk of diarrhea in children. You know how it is. Your child has diarrhea, do you take them to the doctor? You will probably get oral rehydration solution now, but you will get antibiotics and you don't need the antibiotics. So this sort of combination of factors led to my deciding to work on rotavirus. I spent some time in the UK before I went to the US and in both places, I decided that I was going to try and figure out one, how big was the problem of rotavirus in India? And two, was there anything we could do about it? And developing a vaccine on rotavirus, that must have been a huge challenge, a huge idea in the first place. Tell us well, a bit more about how you went about it. I didn't develop the vaccine. So, you know, if you look at vaccine development, it's never one person. It's always different people at different steps of vaccine development. And then when you start to use the vaccine, there are still more people. So what I would say, I would not lay claim to developing the vaccine. I would, however, lay claim to 
all of the studies that led to the vaccine finally being used. So whether it is a question of building up a picture to the government that did not particularly want to introduce a rotavirus vaccine, to show what the burden really was, to look at the economic impact, to figure out the diversity of rotaviruses, to look at the immune response that infections and vaccines induced, um, to look at uh, and also test a vaccine. We did phase one studies, phase two studies, phase three, phase four, and we worked on four vaccines. And two of those vaccines are now used across the country, and two of the vaccines failed. You never hear about the two vaccines that failed. You only hear about the success stories. So, so that that brings into light such, you know, the the reality of of medical research, isn't it? I mean, uh, the the whole idea of actually setting up a study, the whole idea that it may fail, that you know, the 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 real goal is to find the truth about whether something works or not, and it must have taken years of of effort. How how, how long did it take? Well, the rotavirus work took us from 2000 to 2014 when the vaccine fin first vaccine got licensed and the second vaccine in 2016. The vaccines that failed were in 2016 and 2017. So uh, now, of course, every child born in India gets a rotavirus vaccine and I have worked on both of those vaccines. That, that is so amazing. I, I, I feel that, I, I guess, w when I see the next child taking their vaccine, we, we will think of your team and the effort that it took. We, we often don't know the origins and the, and the hard work that has gone into, uh, you know, developing a vaccine. And, and, and really, I mean, if you contrast that to COVID-19, I mean, the entire scenario, I guess, has changed within a couple of years. We have a number of vaccines in development, uh, the, the whole idea of you know, 14 years versus two years. Do you think that in a way the COVID-19 pandemic has really you know, shaken up the vaccine development process and, and is that a good thing? It has and it's a wonderful thing. So one of the things that's important to remember about vaccine development is that all of vaccine development has the first focus is safety. You want to make sure, because vaccines are given to healthy people, that they are as safe as possible. You'll compromise on the efficacy, but you won't compromise on the safety of vaccines. Now, in the development of vaccines, you tend to take it slow because regulators want to stop after every step and review the data. So you do the preclinical studies in animals and the regulator reviews that, gives you approval for the first human study. You finish the first human study, the regulator then waits and reviews that. And then you go to the second phase of the study and then the third phase of the study. And each of these phases, particularly the third phase, can last for several years, depending on the number of studies that are being done. And because the focus is safety, you start small, you start with 10 to 100 people, then you go to 100 to 1,000 people, then you go 1,000 to 10,000 people for phase three studies. And in the phase three studies where you're looking at the efficacy of the vaccine, you will generally follow up people for at least a couple of years. So the whole vaccine development cycle can take a really long time. The shortest vaccine that had been developed before SARS-CoV-2 was four years for a mumps vaccine that was developed in the 1960s. The other thing is doing vaccine trials is very expensive. So anybody who wants to develop a vaccine either needs to have a very large bank account or stop and start when you get the funding. 
The differences with SARS-CoV-2 vaccination was that there was no compromise on safety. There was no compromise on any of the testing for immune response for efficacy. The things that were different. First one, the regulators did not do stop and start. The regulators, like our Drug Controller General of India, the FDA, the EMA, they can take three months, six months to review each stage of a study. They did that in two weeks. They set up to get rolling submissions. As soon as a certain amount of data was available, the companies or the programs could submit it to them and they started reviewing immediately. So the regulators' prioritization of these projects shortened the timelines. The second thing was being able to have practically unlimited money, more money than had been spent on vaccine development before. It's been estimated that developing one new vaccine can cost about half a billion dollars. And we know that the US alone spent about $18 billion on the development of the vaccines that they had. Some failed, some succeeded. Moderna came out of that program. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine came out of that program. So Pfizer decided it didn't want the US funding, but it sold its doses to the US. But nonetheless, $18 billion to develop essentially three successful vaccines. So when you have deep pockets like that, instead of doing the slow, careful study, you can now make it very big. And when you have very large numbers, you know, usually you do small numbers because you can follow up only a certain number of people. So you extend the duration of the study. When you can have very large numbers, you can get the results in a shorter time frame. So that person time accumulation can be addressed by recruiting lots more people. That's why the numbers that we hear in the phase three clinical trials for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines have been much larger than we usually see for vaccine trials. 25,000, 30,000, 40,000, 45,000 people being recruited into a trial means that it's a very expensive trial, but it was a very fast trial. So it was worth it. What do you think are the challenges of, you know, doing studies like this in India? Do you think the challenges are a bit different from, from the West or, or are they the same? Well, in India, everybody is suspicious about research. Nobody, you know, what did we read in the newspapers about clinical research? Poor Indians used as guinea pigs. Right now, it seems perfectly all right in your field, Indranil. Clinical research, clinical trials are just fine because many of the new drugs and medicines that you bring to people are kind of a last resort for some patients. Right, the approaches that you bring to them are a last resort, so they are willing to put up with side effects. Whereas if you have a study that is done on healthy people, the most minor of side effects will be blown up. In as we saw with the Absolutely. AstraZeneca trial, right? One person from Chennai going to court saying that I developed a neurological disease after taking the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's what usually happens with research in India because people don't have an understanding that tomorrow's medicines will not come without today's experiments. And those experiments have to be done on people. We have to be guinea pigs in order to develop new drugs and vaccines. And I hope that the Indian clinical research landscape will change after COVID. Do you think that the, the lessons from, you know, vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2 will actually lead to, you know, vaccines now in the other, you know, uh, important infectious diseases that are taking so many lives in India? Do you think that, or, is, or are those diseases more complicated to deal with? Um, 
I think some of the hard targets, TB is a hard target. Malaria is a hard target. Those are bacteria and parasites. But HIV is a hard viral target because HIV virus mutates and changes all the time. But now that we have so many new technologies, the viral vectors, the mRNA, the DNA vaccines, I think we have the opportunities to be able to experiment more and look at whether we can use these new tools to solve the problems that we were unable to solve with older technologies. So these are very real opportunities. And I hope that we will leverage them to address these big public health problems in the world. The other thing that I think is important to think about is diseases that matter to us in our location. For example, last week I was contacted by a group of ecologists in Bangalore. They work in the Western Ghats. And they wrote to me to say, can you help us get hold of Kyasnur forest disease vaccine? Now, Kyasnur forest disease is a viral hemorrhagic fever only in India. There is an inactivated vaccine. It's not the best. It's the only vaccine there is. And right now, because of quality control issues, they've decided to stop manufacturing it. So it's going to take a while to figure it out. In the meantime, you have these people that need to go into the forest that know that there is a vaccine, but they can't get it. So I'm hoping that with the new technologies, it will be possible for us to think about diseases that are specific to us and have these platforms, which will allow us to make high quality vaccines in small volumes so that we can address our needs in terms of infectious diseases. Do you, do you think malaria, dengue are, are in the pipeline? Do you think that they are challenges that we can, I mean? Every virus, every bacterium, every parasite is complicated. So you can't borrow everything that you have learned from one virus and apply it directly to a different pathogen. You need an understanding of the disease and then you need to do the experiments. So I think the technologies offer a lot of promise, but until we do the testing, we will not have clear answers. So we come directly to COVID-19 and I guess the, the main, you know, news or uh, you know, what everybody's experiencing and talking about is the, uh, the Omicron, the, the booster doses and children coming back to school. So we'll, we'll just discuss those issues and what your views are about them. So, so starting, starting with booster doses, I think that there, there is this, uh, you know, we've seen other countries, the you know the developed countries take booster doses as sacrosanct. You have to, you know, everybody, all adults have to have the booster. They put in regulations in place. People can't cross the border. People can't work. Uh, I mean, given this context, do do you think that the same applies to India? Do all Indians really need the booster dose? Um, no, I don't think all Indians need the booster dose right now. Because I think we need a clearer understanding of what kind of booster, given at what time, will benefit us most. Right? So everybody's got two doses. We've got Covishield. We've got Covaxin. A few people got Sputnik. Let's treat it as equivalent to Covishield. Now, the way Covishield has been used in India, it has not been used in the same way in any country from which we have data. You know, Covishield has a side effect, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, which happens in one in 40,000 vaccinated people. So many high income countries decided that they were not going to give it to their younger populations because the risk was higher in younger populations. 
In India, we have given it to 18 plus. Was well, we didn't have a choice. Covishield is the vaccine that we've used for nearly 90% of our population because that was the one for which doses were available when Covaxin was in short supply. So we have used Covishield in a way where the data from the West does not apply to us because we've given it to different ages than from the rest of the world. Now, if we stratify by age and say, where do we have comparable ages? We can take the 60 pluses. And in the 60 pluses, borrowing data from the West, it makes sense to give a booster dose because above 60, you have lower protective immune responses. And therefore, it you know, when you give a third dose of vaccine, there is good protection against hospitalization. When should you give it? The data that is available from other countries seems to indicate that about six months after you have received your two doses, your protection against Omicron, which is the variant that is capable of most escaping the immune response, drops to about 44%. And if you take a booster dose, it goes above 80% for protection against hospitalization. So for over 60s, based on the data available from elsewhere, absolutely makes sense to take a booster dose. And what we've labeled as a precautionary dose is essentially a booster dose. Now, I know it says nine months. But quite frankly, I think nine months is fine. Six months is also fine. Now, will we, after this, require another booster in these populations? Simple answer, we don't know. We don't know what the next variant will look like. We don't know whether a fourth dose will really help. We don't know whether we should give it after six months, nine months, or a year. If you've already had three doses, when should you get the next one? With Covaxin, we have even less data because we have nothing to borrow from anywhere else. Covaxin is an inactivated vaccine. In the inactivated vaccines in use in other parts of the world, the vaccines don't work very well. They've given two doses of the vaccine and then everywhere the booster has been mRNA for the most part. One, Thailand has used AstraZeneca as a booster for to pe for people who had received uh, the Sinovac vaccine, right? So we have nothing to compare it to. Should we give a booster dose? We don't know. The only effectiveness, real world effectiveness data we have for Covaxin is in healthcare workers. They are a younger population. That's not generalizable. So essentially without data, we are largely flying blind. So that's the data piece. Now we come to my opinion. So I want to qualify it as my opinion. I think what we need to think about is the fact that a lot of our country got infected. With Delta, a lot of people got infected. With Omicron, a lot of people have been infected. The 67% zero positivity that we saw in June of last year was largely driven by infection and not by vaccination. Now, data from the West also shows us that if you've received two doses of vaccine and been infected once, that's like having been naturally boosted. Okay, you don't really need the booster. So in that sense, I think if we look at the younger population that already has a low risk of hospitalization, I'm, I'm not sure that we need a third dose. What are we protecting them against? The remote chance of hospitalization. So I think if you're immunocompromised, you have comorbidities, or you're an older individual, absolutely get a booster, get it after six months. In my opinion, probably we are going to find that using a vaccine that's different from the one you got originally yeah. is going to be better than the one that you know the same series but that's still an opinion without indian data being available it's based on data from the west but 
and that's right. only the new yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, 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 do you think that the government? I mean, I, I know that it's their choice, but do you think that the government should promote, you know, people using a different vaccine, or they can't do that because there's no data for it? Well, I think we have now five vaccines that are supposed to be available shortly. I don't think we are going to see a lot of Sputnik. We will see a lot of Covax and Corbivax. Now that they have been approved, I don't know how the government is going to use them. Zydus Cadilla seems to have manufacturing issues, so I don't think it's going to be a large player anytime soon. So that's going to leave us essentially with four vaccines, Covishield, Covaxin, Covovax, and Corbivax. Of them, Covaxin will continue to have limited supply. The other three will be made in large volumes. If we can mix and match doses for the boosters, then it would be really good to have the Covovax and Corbivax data. For AstraZeneca and Covovax, the data already exists from a study that was done in the UK that shows that at least in terms of an immune response, the combination of AstraZeneca and Covovax is better than giving a third dose of AstraZeneca as a boost. That is really interesting. I, and I, I think that, that if you, uh, talking about data, you, you mentioned that there's a lack of data. And, and, you know, at least over the last few months or years, a uh, couple of years, we, we have often struggled with the lack of clear data, the lack of published data, the lack of, you know, safety data in, in a believable scientific format. Uh, yeah. Do you think it's because of the you know the speed required for development, or is it could it have been done better and, and clearer so that there was less ambiguity? I think what a lot of people don't understand is what is the critical data. You know, everybody thinks more data is better, but if more data is in a format that is unusable, then you're wasting your time and effort. What are the critical things that you need to know in order to know whether a vaccine is performing or not, right? Among people who test positive, were they symptomatic or not? What was their age? When were they vaccinated and which vaccines did they get? That's it. Is that complicated? to collect, you know, at the point where you're giving a test, can't you collect this information for everybody? You're collecting age already. You're going to get the test result when you do the test. What you need is an accurate history of when they got the vaccine. If they were, ultimately, you will compare among the people who test positive, how many were vaccinated, which vaccine they got, and were they unvaccinated. Right? That's going to tell you whether the vaccine is actually protecting people from infection or from symptoms. We don't seem to be able to do that. And it's not because the data are not collected. It's because the data are collected separately and then they have trouble making them talk to each other. Right. And, and personally, I, I've had this issue about the safety of uh, you know, for example, co-vaccine co in children and, and, you know, other vaccines in children. I mean, the government just declares that it's it's available it's for safe. children. Yeah, I, so this is a problem that I really have, is that when you make a statement, you must back it up by data. When I have facts, I will tell you the facts. When it is an opinion, I will tell you the opinion and hopefully frame it so that you understand what my opinion is based on. The What we hear largely about the directives that we get from government is, we are saying it, therefore do it. And that is a bit of a problem, right? So it's not really backed up by information. And as scientists, it's our duty to question, to be able to confirm that the interpretation of the data is correct, that the data are of high quality. 
But if we never see the data, how can we say that? And particularly the point that you brought up about safety is essential. Vaccines are given to healthy people. Vaccines are given to healthy children. We must know and understand what is happening in terms of safety signals. Now, this whole thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or Guillain-Barre syndrome, where did the data on this come from? Remember, during the vaccine trials, we were worried about transverse myelitis. We were worried about neurological symptoms that might be associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Well, when the vaccine is used in very, very large numbers, we are not seeing transverse myelitis. But we saw thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, right? Low platelets, antiplatelet factor four. And that was picked up because high income countries had pharmacovigilance programs, safety monitoring programs that were looking for signals. And when they found a signal, they investigated it very quickly. India has used more doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine than any other country in the world. We've used more than a billion doses of vaccine and we cannot find a signal. We've had half a dozen cases that they've said are associated. Now, if Australia says one in 40,000, one in 40,000 means we should have had hundreds of cases in India. We haven't, not even 10. So our safety system is not working. And why is safety monitoring important? Because people need to recognize when they see a side effect so that it can be managed appropriately. The mortality for TTS in Australia is 3%. In India, in the cases that have been described, I think one person survived. And I think that if you if you look at, uh, you know, uh, you know, vaccination and, and then you know, children going back to schools, for example. I mean, do you think that the, the vaccination is, is really related to this issue about children going back to school or children should go back to school nevertheless because they have low risk and, and because it's, it's now coming to be two years and, and, and our kids are, are at home? I think it should have gone back to school as soon as the Delta wave subsided. You know, we were learning about the virus initially and it was complicated and we wanted to do the best we could for our children. But by the middle of last year, we knew very clearly that if your child is generally healthy, does not have comorbidities, there is a very, very, very low risk of developing severe disease. In most cases, you're not going to know that your child was even infected. And that was backed up last June with the zero survey. 60% of Indian children in that zero survey were zero positive. Most of them had no clue that they had ever been infected or how. And this is with children staying at home with lockdowns, with no school. Obviously, parents were bringing it home to their children. Otherwise, how would they have acquired this infection since their main social interactions with people outside the home were not happening, right? So you've got a situation where 60% of kids are seropositive. They acquired the infection without symptoms. Why do you want to keep children at home anymore if they have no comorbidities? Now, associating this with vaccination. It, it It's not like vaccination has no benefit for children. Even that tiny risk that exists in children can be lowered with vaccination. But the question to me is, do we want to give them any vaccine? Or do we want to give them a vaccine that we know really decreases disease in children? And for those, we only have data from the mRNA vaccines. You know, from COVAXIN, we have immunogenicity data. If I was guaranteed 
that every child that gets Covaxin is then entered into a vaccine effectiveness study so that we generate data in the 15 to 18 year olds so that we can make a decision about 12 to 15. I would be saying, let's go, let's do this. Now I'm sitting back and thinking, well, we weren't able to generate data for Covaxin in adults. So the likelihood of generating effectiveness data for Covaxin in children is very low. We are essentially going to be giving children a vaccine for which we are never going to know whether it worked or not. And is that what we want to do to our kids? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think and that's a very clear message from you, the importance of doing you know, collecting data, of presenting the data, of actually asking the right questions when it when it comes to such an important topic. So, uh, you know, winding down, we've got five minutes before questions. So I want to ask you about the importance of public health. You know, everywhere in the world, we've, we, all the countries, even the richest countries have been caught with their, you know, pants down because their public health wasn't prepared to deal with something at this scale or even, you know, by, by several orders of magnitude. Where do you think we as a country, if we, if we want to be really serious about all our citizens, where do you think we should go in terms of preparing think, ourselves against, uh, you know, disease? Well, looking at infectious diseases, the first and most important thing is the ability to detect a signal. If you take a look at the Delta that seemed to originate in India and then spread around the world during 2021, the cases started to climb in February. The government didn't admit that there was a problem until the middle of April, right? So two months to be able to detect a signal that was clear as day right or admit to a signal that was as clear as day. so you need signal detection capacity you need transparency so that you share this with the world compare what happened with delta with what happened with omicron it, you know south africa announced within two weeks of their first detection of the case here's the sequence this is something that we need to watch out for they were real leaders in the field. They admitted there was a problem. And you know you could have argued that how can you announce it just based on two weeks of data? And their early warning allowed the rest of the world to become much, much more prepared. We got lucky that Omicron wasn't serious. But if it had been, at least there wasn't a two month gap between it appearing and admitting that there was a real problem. So I think signal detection capacity is very clear as something we have to build around the world. Data sharing has to be around the world. The other thing to think about is universal health coverage. How do people access care? You know, so we did some remarkable things during the pandemic, whether it is telemedicine or it is frontline workers. What we need to do is to be able to empower people so that they can access care either locally, so well-trained frontline workers that have referral systems where they can confidently send people who require higher levels of care or remote access where you can manage people who can be managed at home at a distance and again have referral pathways so that people who need a higher level of care wind up in the right place. And uh, another thing, I mean, I think that one of the things that's really, really, uh, you know, been a bone of contention is the, you know, uh, writing of unnecessary medications by extremely educated doctors. And, and I think that there needs to be more education on how to imbibe evidence, how to communicate science and things like that. Do, do you agree with that? 
Um, absolutely, Indranil. In fact, you know, I said signal detection and I said access to healthcare. And then I was thinking, oh, I should have added that what we really need is a learning health system so that we are constantly informed about what is the right thing to do for the right patient, you know, starting with ivermectin, azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, right at the beginning of the pandemic was fine because we didn't know whether they would work or not. And there was at least biological plausibility. But when we didn't, you know, when we knew they weren't going to work, to still continue to use them is completely unethical. And unfortunately, that's the situation we were in in India. So absolutely learning within health systems, practicing appropriate medicine within health systems is essential. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. I, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'll now hand over to Dr. Rupali Basu, uh, to, to uh, Mrs. Roy, actually. And, and she's going to, you know, uh, Take you over to yes. Dr. Basu for the Thank questions. Thank you. And now our committee member, Dr. Rupali Basu, Managing Director and CEO of Woodlands Multi-Speciality Hospital, will take up questions from LSG members and the audience. Now, Rupali, carry on. Thank you, Shumita. The end was what a discourse. What a nice conversation we had. So much to learn. Dr. Kang, thank you so much. And Indranil for those, uh, you know, very vital questions that you put up to Dr. Kang. Uh, so I have a few questions with me, which uh, we have cal collected from our members. Um, I being the, you know, the one part of it. So I will, maybe I will take the opportunity to ask you the first question. You know, uh, when, the, when the whole uh, episode of uh, COVID happened for the last two years, we understood the value of vaccination, and uh, in in my hospital, I started doing a you know a standalone vaccination center, which is nothing to do with uh, the hospital, but a separate center where uh, people did not, you know, need not have to be exposed to the COVID environment in the hospitals, and uh, you know started giving COVID vaccinations and all all the levels the way it has started, and now I'm thinking that going forward. Uh, is this uh, also can become a vaccination uh, for the other diseases, children immunization? Should we put more emphasis on vaccination in the future? What do you think? Uh, do you think that there is a there is importance in uh, vaccination? Importance will will go up. So, well, Rupali, Indranil asked absolutely brilliant questions and took me back to stuff that. I haven't reviewed in a while with rotavirus vaccines and the development of various vaccines that we've worked on. But the question that you're asking is looking towards the future and the future of vaccination. And, you know, one of the things that people don't realize is that there is already unmet need for vaccination. We don't do adult vaccination, right? Influenza vaccines, I'm not sure that they need to be given every year, but certainly influenza vaccines have a huge role to play for healthcare workers and at least for people over 60 years of age, and certainly for those with comorbidities. We should be, you know, you can't get zoster vaccine in India because there just isn't enough supply. And I'm sure all of you have seen patients with Zoster. So if there was demand, the Indian market is large enough to be able to get vaccine manufacturers to either make vaccines that they are not making or import vaccines that are not currently available in the country. So I certainly hope that COVID-19 has emphasized the value of prevention and vaccines are a very important part of prevention across all age groups. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that's what I needed to hear. So uh, there was a question from one of our members that this, she's saying that India's Drug Regulatory Authority has approved clinical trials to the nasal vaccine. 
which the scientists say is the first to have shown promise that it might block both infection as, as well as transmission. Will it confer sterilizing immunity or stop the virus from replicating in the body? What is your view on the nasal vaccine? So much of the data on suppression. So one thing is when a vaccine company puts out data, wait till you see it in a peer reviewed publication. And um, there are promising data from nasal vaccines. So there are animal studies that have been done at Yale that have looked at giving the inactivated vaccine without an adjuvant to mice and have shown that replication of the virus has been suppressed. And in a challenge model, there was good protection against SARS-CoV-2. So that, it's promising. But all animal studies are always going to be reasonably promising. The real proof of the pudding is when it gets into humans and we see how it does. So the approach makes sense. We could look at, we've done this before. We've done it for polio, where we've used a mucosal vaccine, the oral vaccine with the inactivated vaccine to give us both mucosal and systemic immunity. So if it works, it would probably give us better protection than the parental vaccine, the injectable vaccine alone. But I will caution that so far, influenza vaccines, when given through the mucosal route, have not been as good as injectable vaccines. The same is true for polio. And measles vaccines that were tried through the in intranasal route also mm -hmm. did not do as well as the injectable mm -hmm. um, measles vaccine. So basically, good idea. Let's wait and see. Thank you. OK, so um, the second question was that, uh, you know, the number of private hospitals as well as uh, I think even uh, medical colleges are reporting that the vaccine vestige is happening now because of the low turnout of the for the vaccine now. You know the precaution dose, the uh, 15 plus, uh, and then what should this, the hospitals and government should do to prevent this vestige of vaccine? I personally think that there is also my my own uh, calculation is about 27, 28 percent of population are not even thinking of taking a, you know, a third dose, precaution or booster, whatever you call it. They're not willing to take it. They're, they don't think it is necessary. So it's a mindset issue with this, and there is no regulation. It's all voluntary. So they're not even coming. And so, the vestiges are happening. Yeah, wastage is usually about 10% in any public immunization program. And one of the reasons that you have high levels of wastage is because you have a multi-dose um, vial that is used for the vaccines. Now, that is good for programmatic use. That is not good for uh, individual vaccination. So a lot of companies elsewhere in the world to reduce the wastage have decreased their pack size. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a 10 dose vial, you could look at a five dose vial or a two dose vial so that you would have less wastage of the vaccines. And since this is only a packaging change, even though it requires regulatory approval, I think it's time that the vaccine companies thought about a differentiated product for the public market and the private market. Thank you. We'll pass it on to the owners of those companies. Um, so uh, the other question was that, uh, you know, how much study has been, I think you have actually talked about the side effects of vaccine in the, to the human body in the, but then, you know, there is a question that how much study has been done because they, we know that it's, these vaccines are all been done in very short time. So in particular human reproduction system, someone is asking, is it a grave cons concern to the society at large? large? Well, thankfully, there have now been enough studies that have shown that vaccines um, are not a concern when it comes to women of reproductive age. In fact, vaccines given during pregnancy have resulted in lower rates 
of preterm birth. And children born to women who are vaccinated have a higher rate of protection against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you're protecting not only the mother, but the baby. I think the important thing to remember is most of the vaccines that we have are vaccines that are essentially equivalent to inactivated vaccines. They don't stick around in the body. They are cleared. They don't replicate. So therefore, this is these are not vaccines that are particularly high risk. When we get to live attenuated vaccines, then we can begin to worry about which kinds of populations these vaccines might want to be used in. For example, you wouldn't want to give them to immunocompromised individuals, right? But right now, there is absolutely no evidence that vaccines do anything to the reproductive system. There were a lot of rumors that circulated about cross-reactivity between the mRNA for the spike protein and placental proteins. Well, actually, there was greater cross-reactivity with collagen. And as you know, collagen is part of our connective tissue. So it shouldn't have affected just pregnant women. It should have affected everybody that ever got the vaccine. We've had 10 billion doses of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine given to people in 2021 alone. If these vaccines were really that dangerous, we would have learned that by now. We have already detected signals, viral myocarditis with the mRNA vaccines, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, atypical Guillain-Barre syndrome with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, occasional reports of Bell's palsy, of zoster reactivation. All of these signals are being tracked. And of all of them, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome is the only one that is truly life-threatening. And that's why recognition of side effects is important. But I think these vaccines are as safe as any vaccines we've had prior to this. That's such reaction, reassuring. Thank you so much. So we have one more, one question for Dr. Malik. You know, um, so we'll just give a little rest to Dr. Kang and then yeah. I'll ask Indranil, what are the recent advances in radiation therapy? And then what is the difference between the regular radiation therapy and the proton radiation therapy? That's the question to you. I, I really don't think this is the forum for it, but I think that uh, it's it's, it's a question. I think that, one yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think that proton radiotherapy is one type of radiotherapy that is useful for a small subsection of people. It's really good in certain circumstances, but radiotherapy overall has advanced a lot, and it's it's a very safe and very effective treatment. So I, I think that there's no need to be you know, concerned about, about. And it's part of the multimodal treatment for cancer, right? So it's very much part yes, of the radiation therapy, of course. Yeah. Okay, coming back to Dr. Kang, I think the last uh, two questions. One is that um, uh, Sucheta, our vice president, asked that can pediatric diarrhea uh, lead to Ig and nephropathy at a later stage? She's she was talking from a particular example of a of mm -hmm. a person. So yes. This so, in fact, this is an area that has been investigated and pediatric diarrhea that leads to dehydration and therefore to acute renal damage can be associated with IgA nephropathy in later life. There are, um, the problem is that you don't necessarily have all the different kinds of investigations available for all children to be able to follow this up. But wherever people have looked for signals, they have, there is plausibility that this could be a pathway. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So the last question to you, I think uh, the, maybe with the good news we can you know, end the session is that when do we call off the pandemic? 
So I think the important thing to remember is that lots of coronaviruses have crossed over into humans before, and we live with them, and we do all right, except for SARS and MERS that are really bad killers, right? For SARS, 10% mortality rate. For MERS, 35% mortality rate. And for SARS-CoV-2, among cases, not among infections, among cases, you're talking about 1%. So this is really not a killer virus. And vaccination has made it even less um, of a killer than it was before. It's just that the numbers were so humongous. We've got tools now. We've got science now. We've got policies now. I think we will do much better in the future. New variants will continue to be a concern, not just for SARS-CoV-2, but for new viruses emerging from somewhere. But human ingenuity being what it is, the state of the science that we have today, I don't think these are problems that we can't deal with. Absolutely. So, Shumita Di, we can hand it over to you that if uh, Dr. Kang is the policymaker and is in the sitting in the government, I think she would just say that the pandemic can be called off and we don't have to really be so worried about COVID-19 now. So, over to you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kang. Thank you, Indranil. Thank you so very much for allowing me to be here talking to both of you. Yes. Now I call upon our Vice President Sucheta Mayer to give the vote of thanks. Sucheta, yes. Good evening, Dr. Kang, Dr. Malik, Tomita Di, and Rupali. Namaskar to all. For the study group, we can't thank you enough for such an informative insight into the pandemic vaccine and so much more about COVID-19. The challenges of the pandemic were and are so huge that we salute to you doctors and healthcare workers. Thanking you again. Thank you viewers and the media for your support. Over to you, Sumita Ji. Well, we are more knowledgeable and updated on the status of COVID-19 and we have better perspective about how to carry on better and normal lifestyle. Thank you, Dr. Kang and Dr. Mulle for a very engaging session on a very relevant topic. Thank you all and Namushka to all of you. Thank you.